Uh, sorry, guys, I've got my glasses, so if I, if I write something, I'm going to have to run up to that or look real closely here. If I do make an error, um, just a little bit of patience with that. I've got my clear glasses all the way down. Uh, I can see everything just fine here. So just a little bit blurry and a little bit noisy today. Um, we will start up our Zoom um, yes no maybe for today. The only day that we're going to do it like this. Uh, so we'll start interacting in a moment when we switch over. Exam is on Wednesday in class. So if you have quarantine issues, let me know about that. Otherwise, that's your one obligation for the class. Which are distribution we've been talking about? So this is a scalar, this is a matrix, and it's a distribution over matrices. So the random variable is a matrix itself. Um, the PDF, of course, is a one-dimensional thing like PDFs so. are. So you plug in matrices, and it's a, this function gets bigger. It's telling you that those are well-liked matrices in this distribution. There's scale behavior and everything. Um, talk about some of the problems of this. I like to remember this right here in this various parameterization, how I interpret the mean of something. So it has something to do with this diffusion parameter. So that thing right here. And that's going to have something to do with diffusion. How do I know that? I look at the variance. And as gamma goes up, this becomes more variable. So it's kind of spreading out the distribution. Um, sometimes I parameterize everything like this. So that the expectation is omega, but the variance is still going to um, be the same thing. So it's just going to have to do with gamma. So if you want to untangle it, you could do it in this setting. I make that recommendation on the wrapped problem. I think I called this parameter row. But I do it like that for interpretation of everything. So which our distribution is what we are studying. Big key take home point is it's the conjugate prior for things like covariance matrices or inverses of covariance matrices. On the homework, I ask you to cover a problem where you're doing everything on sigma scale. And so the conjugate prior there will be inverse Wishart. And in this example, I'll show you that Wishart is the uh, conjugate prior on sigma inverse the precision matrix. Um, keep in mind, I can transform one to the other. So it just depends on how you like to stare at your parameters and interpret them. There's a nice handout online that walks you through the interpretation of precision. And I take you through the partial regression coefficients, kind of an interpretation, but I always interpret everything as conditional independence. Um, so conditionally on everything else in the set, what groups are independent of other groups? Okay. The conditional part is very important. It's like in a regression interpretation, given that everything is in there, what does this parameter mean? Um, if you interpret your parameters marginally, you are making a fundamental critical mistake in your interpretation. Okay, so we were leading off last time with this example, XIs are normally distributed. I'm going to do everything in this setting, in the RAT problem, and other problems. Everything does have this sort of formulation, but there's more parameters floating around and models more complicated. And so you'll carry forth this analysis on your homework and butter it up in the context of that example we've been studying courtesy of Gelfin. Um, so our model is just this thing. Um, this is the likelihood function right here. So I'll just write down this is the likelihood. Likelihood of what? Uh, depends. So I plug in the x's. If I knew what mu is and I didn't know what sigma was, and it would be a likelihood function of this thing. But really, it's a joint likelihood function as it's written down right here. It's proportional to the sample distribution. Uh, we're about a step or two from recognizing this as um, something that looks like a wish art. Keep in mind, this is not a wish art. It's a likelihood function. So likelihoods are not distributions. Um, but we can recognize the conjugate prior through them. What do I have to multiply by and have everything just slide through? Um, and it would still be wish art. Um, I'm just going to tell you right now, 
which are is to conjugate prior on this. You can look back at this distribution right here and see that there's some other terms involved. And in fact, there's this trace right here that somehow we have to get into our equation. I've done one simplification where I took the minus sign that I normally throw up here, and I just drug it inside the determinant. And so powers of determinants um, can go on the outside of the determinant or the inside. And the technical term is homomorphism for this. It's the way that I understood it when I learned about this. Uh, I'm going to plug in another term, right? Or not another term, but I'm just going to algebraically adjust this. And I wrote in the trace. And the reason I can do that right there, you can't just drop a trace on something and it stays the same, except in one particular case. And that's when you're dealing with a scalar. So this is a scalar. This is all one dimensional. So scalar. 1D. This is the scalar right here. So I can take the trace of this right here. Um, I can also drag my summation signs out of traces. And that's what we learned on the homework. So trace of A plus B is trace of A plus the trace of B. And so I can um, cut this trace inside of this sum. And so there are linear operators the sum factorizes out. So I'm just going to adjust this a little bit. Write down this is e to the minus one half trace. And I'm going to put my sum over here, if you don't mind, for a second. I goes from one to n. I'll do trace of xi's minus mu transpose sigma inverse. Be careful with the sigmas. One of them's a parameter and one of them's an operator. So I'll notate this one with um, the indices just to be really clear. Xi minus mu right here. So I've got that trace. What we learned about traces before, I just used this property. I'll write it over here. Trace of A plus B is equal to the trace of A plus the trace. Some of the diagonals. I like to think about the trace this way when I do this proof. And it couldn't make it simpler. You can just see it. Yeah, I agree. Um, I've also asked you to do another proof on your previous homework that said the trace of A, B, C is equal to the trace of C, A, B. And it's also equal to the trace of B, C, A. And that's true. Um, I had you do it in a much simpler case, just with A and B in there, but you can, if it works for that, then you can start thinking about these things as chunks of two and partition the way you want. Basically, you're allowed to pull this thing around right here, and then you can pull this one around to the other side, and you can cyclically permute all of the elements. You can't shuffle them in any old way. And just think about this, they're matrices as well, they have to conform in their multiplication. But that's true as well. And so what I can do down here is I can rotate this thing around right here. And this is starting to look a lot more like a wish art. So my wish art has my random variable, over on the right hand side, and it's multiplied by the inverse of something, some other matrix. So my random variable that we're talking about is sigma inverse. The random variable also shows up right here. We have that term here. So all of a sudden, I'm able to rewrite all of this again. So let me just get a piece of paper. and rewrite this. So our likelihood function is just going to be sigma inverse n over 2 e to the 
minus one half. Be doing a bunch of things inside of here. This will look like. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to do one extra step right here. Let me write trace right here. So my trace is there. And I'm going to drag my summation inside in the next step as well. So I've got xi minus mu, xi minus mu transpose times sigma inverse. And so to do that, I reapply this on the last step when I absorb my sum inside of everything. So I use this identity, then I use this, and then I use this one more time. And now this thing is starting to look very Wishart to us. So I think this looks like the kernel of a Wishart. So it looks like a Wishart. I did write down again what the wish art looked like. We're going to use it in this form, is our prior. It is the same exact equation right here. I've just rewritten everything in terms of sigma um, inverse is my random variable. There are these elements that pop up down here. I've written it all down in the denominator down here. This is all normalizing constant in our equation. And so this is all the bit that um, is the kernel of that distribution. So just to be clear on the homework in that uh, problem concerning a multivariate t, when I ask you to integrate over sigma inverse, I think in that formulation I asked you to integrate over sigma, you'll probably have to pull out your inverse with our table to understand what all the normalizing constant looks like. This thing integrating over this matrix right here is that. What am I really writing down here? There's a whole bunch of integral signs. I just don't write them all down. So I usually only write one down. And I'll say this is over sigma inverse right here. So I haven't written down multiple integration signs for quite some time now. I usually just look over on the right hand side, see what the flag of integration is, and it's telling me what I'm integrating over. What does this integration mean? All the elements of the matrix. So if I were integrating over a density, Matrix would be every element to that matrix. Keep in mind, these are symmetric, positive de definite matrices, so there's constraints on them. So you're only integrating over one of the triangular sides. That's what that means, and it comes out to be this. If you went through this and you tried to do it, you probably want to expand all of this. It would be a pretty ugly parts calculation, super high dimensional, be all these little gammas that would be floating around, and you could rewrite it and express it like this. Um, I've never done that exercise. So I did it for a two by two for a minute, and I could see that this was coming out of that. Um, so you're encouraged to do that. If you want to learn more about mathematics and operating on matrices, a fun problem is to take the wish art and try to transform it into the inverse wish art. And you'll come up with this problem in the middle where you don't know how to take derivatives over your matrices and inverting them. So you'll have to go back to your matrix handbook and figure out what those derivatives look like. It involves a big tensor problem. Uh, you don't have to do that problem, but they're just little built-in subtle problems that you can always practice. Get a distribution you don't know, transform it to another one that you don't know, and you'll start to familiarize yourself with them and all the mathematics in between. I don't know what class teaches that. I've never seen that class. So I think it's called calculus. It's all the same stuff. It's just higher dimensional representations. OK. Um, so there's our likelihood function. Let's just multiply it by our prior distribution. It's just this stuff right here. So I'm just going to write that down. So our posterior distribution. given all of my data, which are these vectors of x's, so um, the 
XIs. I'm just going to write it down as cap X. So that's just all these um, XIs, X1, X2, and XN. Each of these X's are k-dimensional. Just as a reminder, my posterior distribution is going to be proportional to my likelihood function, sigma inverse, n over 2, e to the minus 1 half trace. Sum of the xi's minus mu. I goes from 1 to n. xi minus mu transpose times sigma inverse. Uh, let me just ask you, does anybody recognize that term? The yeah, it looks like the unscaled covariance matrix. So it's an outer product. That's what covariance matrices are doing. So that's the covariance. Subtract off your center of everything. And so what would you divide by to make this an unbiased estimator of the covariance? Usually we have to divide by something to do with n. Yeah, it's like n minus 1 sounds pretty good. Just says n minus k. Anybody else? So in this case, it kind of depends. If I know mu, I would use it, and I would divide by n. So if I didn't know mu in this sort of form, I plug in x bar. And there's k degrees of freedom that I soak up. So the unbiased estimator usually involves n minus k that we divide by. But that's when we have to plug in x bar. So in a one-dimensional exercise, that k would be 1. That's why we divide by that. But if you did know what the centering parameter is, you divide by n. So if that doesn't make sense, that's what that whole homework problem is about. It'll come up with everything. Your problem will be in terms of n minus k um, on that multivariate t problem. We are integrating um, if you integrate out the views. That's the way it works out. OK. So but yeah, it looks like the covariance matrix. So it's the, the chunk of it that you use to estimate everything. So that's the sufficient statistic. Now I'm going to multiply by my prior. Just use the same parameterization. I'm not going to write down all of my normalizing constants. Say so sigma inverse gamma minus k minus 1 over 2 e to the minus 1 half trace omega inverse sigma inverse. And so, producting everything together, we're going to reapply this identity right here, that I'm going to absorb the things in the exponent and I'll be able to add them up. I'll just do all that in one step. This thing is equal to sigma inverse. This is going to be n minus k. There's that little k thing that's popping up right in front of us. Over 2. I'm going to add in my gamma out in front. So I usually like that thing out in front. This is going to have a minus 1. So it's going to be e to the minus 1 half trace. And then I've got a bunch of terms that show up in here. I've got this outer product, some of the xi's minus v xi minus mu transpose i goes from 1 to n and I'm going to say plus we'll make an inverse times sigma inverse so I did a little bit of factorization there in the middle when I absorbed in my sigma inverse I factorized it over and I used that identity where I could just add together the things and so this thing looks like Wisher, as promised.
then we just need to recognize what the parameters of our wish are. are. And so what are they? Yeah, so I've got, I just need to go back and I need to look at this formulation. That's my inverse wish are. Just need to look at this and figure out where all my parameters are in everything. So I've got this k minus 1 right here. That is the dimensionality of the problems. That's always there in this thing. And so I've got that. So I've got to have that dimensionality sitting right there in the problem. And so I'm not going to soak that k into the end right here. Instead, I look for the parameter here. So now that has the new interpretation of that parameter right there. And then I have to look for this matrix right here, and that's sitting right here. The whole thing, I should say. So this is a wish chart. It has gamma plus n, and I've got this thing right here, xi minus mu, xi minus mu, transpose, and keep in mind when I wrote all this down, I have an omega here in the original formulation, I have an omega inverse that pops up right there. I'll be honest with you, every time I work with these things, I go back to my tables and I make sure everything is right. So, it's easy to forget this, and I do happen to operate on both scales, sigma inverse and sigma, depending on who I'm dealing with. So, a lot to remember. I won't ask you to play around with the wish art on your midterm or final, um, but I encourage you to add it to your list of distributions and familiars, familiarize yourself with it. So, how are you doing with it, Sierra? Getting close? She works with it every day. So part of her um, research. And so, um, what's the expectation of this then? You need your plus omega inverse. Oh. oh, yeah, absolutely. Plus omega inverse in this whole thing is inverted. So, easy stuff to forget. Uh, what's the expectation? That's right, so it's this thing times that thing. So this is just going to be sum of the xi's minus mu, xi minus mu, transpose, plus omega inverse, inverted, times n plus gamma. And I always like us to take a moment and pause and say, does that make any sense to us? Like, that's the massy part of the distribution. It's kind of high dimensional, hard to think about that everything going on right here, but it's just told us this chunk has to do with covariance matrix. So if I'm going to um, estimate the covariance matrix and I use n, what I might do is I might add a little bit to it, and I might add a little bit right here. But the typical MLE estimator is just n times this thing. So let me just write that down. MLE is n times the inverse of that. If you wanted to estimate the covariance structure, a property we know about MLEs, that we exploit it on one of the homeworks, so I would just invert that thing. Okay. Can't quite do that with math estimators. There's the Jacobian term you have to worry about. But this is probably a pretty intuitive estimator for you. So why would you want to add something right here? People do it all the time. So sometimes people have multicollinearity in their data. You're supposed to rip it all out. But if you try to invert something, that's rank deficient, this inverse might not exist. But if I made this full rank right here, and 
it's supposed to be. When we go back to the original distribution, this needs to be something positive definite. It's got full length because of that. Um, then you might want to add a little bit of a penalty. People do this sort of stuff all the time. Reach regression is kind of like that. You might add an identity matrix against something with a little bit of a scale factor. And so you've got a lot of freedom to play around with this. So while we derive this as Bayesians, I see a lot of non-Bayesians use this sort of form. And they'll call it regularization. We've been talking about that all the way through, that our subjective priors, if they're proper, are regularizing our space. So I think this is a good idea. If you derive it like we do as a Bayesian, I think that's even a better idea. But it doesn't matter if this is a good idea to do this. A little bit of penalty right there. We probably wouldn't want this number to be too large because it will dominate what's going on with the asymptotics and the data. You know, if we weren't very data rich, then we might need a little bit of penalty. And so I think Sierra does a little bit something like that, but she doesn't make these parameters really big or like the determinant of this thing to be very large. It's just got a little bit of weight. Um, you can ask her about it sometime if you're curious as to what she's doing. But which art's pretty cool. So now we can go back to all of these questions. What if I were doing joint inference on sigma inverse and mu? What distribution is that? You know, Bayesian has an answer. Don't know what you would call that, but I could be able to give a sample out of everything. And the rat problem kind of does this. The only real silly part of that model is that it was two-dimensional, so it was super low B, um, and probably not a great time series model, but it was okay. But you can start to realize the complexity of everything. I will point out, some people do research just on things like sigma inverse. So in our world, we've got millions of covariates that we want to think about in our models, and how they associate with each other is a major question. So if you think about geneticists, they're always doing this sort of thing. They look over our DNA, and they want to know what parts of it co-vary together, what parts are independent of each other. And so that's a very important genetics question. Um, on the stock market, people want to know which stocks move together. So it's really all about estimating elements of zero that are inside of this matrix. Um, big research problem, big computational problem, and how you do it computationally, that's what makes it, I guess, uh, modern. So it's, it's a hard computational problem. You're dealing with very high dimensional stuff. So anyway, uh, I think that's it for now on Wishart, unless there's any questions. OK, let's do yes, no, maybe. So we have our exam on Wednesday. And this is our session where we can fill out and figure out what is on the exam. So I'm going to say no more until you guys ask me questions. If you ask me a question about something, I will put it in one of these columns. Um, you mentioned the question on the homework. I was wondering if, um, you, if we also have to, if we have to fix, if, if we have to turn the, rest, the entirety of four and number six, uh, the parts of the columns we've not been meant to do, if we have to turn those up. You don't have to turn them in um, on this homework. You can turn them in on the next one. Okay. So you've already got the next homework right in front of you. You've got a, a problem and a half ready for you. So yeah, you don't have to turn it in this time. So we'll let that be on the next homework. If you do turn it in, no penalty. So eventually we'll get it in, but nothing to do right now. We haven't done it.
Dear me, I um, usually get the question how many things are on there. Um, I've written nine questions this weekend, and I'm going to have I'm going to select five of them from that list. And so when I say yes, guaranteed, I mean it's in my nine questions. But yeah, this is absolutely going to be in the five, the subset of five. I entertain um, giving you all nine or maybe making Kevin saying pick five. But I don't know if I want to do that. What do you guys think? Reading becomes a problem. You know, maybe I'll just make it easy. I'll pick five for you. Poisson, uh, maybe. We haven't touched it in this class, so let's go with on this exam, no. We will play around with it. So I'm going to move this over to no, just to be really nice this time, uh, but pretty standard distribution, counting distribution. Uh, we do need to touch that and play around with it, so we'll incorporate it in the, the future part of the class. So, no. NLP. Um, <laughs> that problem is in my nine, so I'm going to say yes, the invariance of MLEs. I did write a problem that pertains to that homework problem to see if you understood it. I don't ask you anything specifically about an MLE, um, but I do ask you about transforming maybe maps. And so I do have that in my list of nine, so I would say the real answer is no, I'm not going to ask you anything about MLEs, but that problem that I, I um, gave you on homework is there. So this has not this one. This is in the no, but invariance of maps. So that one is the one that I'm being specific about. It's on the problem, but I'm not going to ask you anything specific about it. NLA. So hopefully I can answer that in its entirety. What else? Guaranteed. So absolutely the one like I need to work out my Jeffries problem. It is cruise control. It is just a calculus problem. So one-dimensional Jeffries. No multi e stuff. I'll go check. Nothing about a Markov chain, but I did write give sampling problem. So I'm going to write give sampling. It's like the super cool. Exactly. So that's what my question is. I give you a model and I say, like, give me the pseudocode for the give sampling. So really, in disguise, that problem is saying, give me the full conditionals for this distribution, the numerate on and just put some indices on everything in a for loop. Um, yeah, I wrote a problem like that. Nothing theoretical about Markov chains. So I don't have a stationary or limiting distribution question for you, if that disappoints you. There's a lot of fun ones, and we can make them really hard real quick. But again, I, I want to give you more or less the idea of what's happening at MCMC. We will have another at least week on the theoretical underpinnings of Metropolis Hastings. So I think in the future I might ask you some theoretical questions about Markov chains. Not here, though. But just a good sampler sort of basic thing I threw in there. And I like those problems because it's all about just recognizing the distribution. No one? Yeah. Yeah, I wasn't pointing at you, but sorry. Uh, so inside of the computer distribution, we just write the 
Yeah, I would have an instruction there accompanying it. I won't just say, give sample this. You know, and can't really do it on a piece of paper anyway. So yeah, I'll, I'll probably say, implement the pseudocode. Or, sorry, not implement it. Write down the pseudocode. I think we all know what that means. I do have one. So, conjugate prior. And just ask high D. So, yeah, I did put one on there that is more than one dimensional. So, high D. Um, yeah, in spirit, it could be any dimension. So, it's not just like a two dimensional thing. That kind of hones you in on what question I might even have asked. So if I could be arbitrary about the dimensionality of the problem, I know classes of problems just like that. That's why we love these models so much. You know which one it is. Yeah, but high D is not very specific. So do you have any context for that that you were thinking of? It's okay if you don't. Normal. Normal. So, regression. So, I did put a regression model on there. All the things that I just want you to like, just be able to do, you know? Somebody comes in and asks, no problem, piece of cake. I can do that and do it in a couple minutes. So, this is the regression problem. So you guys are doing really good because you're hitting all the yes. It's supposed to be fairly obvious. It's supposed to be. Say it again. Well, this one already answers that question because it is a joint that you're getting at the end of the day. But yeah, there'll be something where it's not just my regression problem isn't going to be a case where everything factorizes trivially. The problem of that paper with the very complex function that was hard to write. That paper of the three Bayesian mathematicians that could never agree. Uh, oh, uh, very good distribution. Could Jeffries, Maynard, and Fisher have agreed? Um, no, I'm not going to do that coverage example. So I have asked that question before in the past, but I'd say nothing. Um, specific to could name it um, Jeffries and Fisher and agree. That problem sometimes creeps up, but nothing on this one. It didn't make my cut. Um, and if you guys are in my book reading club where we're discussing the history of statistics, you're starting to get the feeling like absolutely <laughs> not. So you're supposed to laugh when you read the title, but nobody knows who anybody is anymore. So no way. We weren't going to agree on anything ever. But nothing better. Not, not that coverage thing um, from that example. It's a fun example. Credible interval. Credible interval. I do have a question in my mind about um, identifying a credible interval. I like that question. So some credible interval thing. It's not. It's not hard. <laughs> so it's all I can say. Nothing fancy. I mean, credible intervals, what are they? 95% of the mass. There's other types of credible intervals. So I might um, have a problem where I can distinguish whether or no, not, you know what the difference between different types of credible intervals are. You're allowed to snicker, Sierra, but don't do it when you're right next to a microphone. Oh, 
like that. So it hurts their feelings. So something like the rat problem in the moment? Nothing like the rat problem. So the rat problem is not there. But I mean, in the sense of right down that pipe, whatever likelihood I can give you is going to be easier. So, but I hope that you guys can start writing down likelihoods proficiently. If I tell you the sampling procedure, you should be able to write down the likelihood. I've heard this from a lot of colleagues that are non Bayesians, and they're like, just figure out what the likelihood for this is. And Bayesians, that's like step one. We don't go any further until we can identify what the likelihood is. Function that a lot of people use, but um, rat problems, not there. And no crazy likelihoods. I'm going to see if you're well practiced, not if I can make you think of a ton of stuff on the fly. I did like these exams I had in grad school where there'd be this complex two paragraph setup of the problem, and it's like, discuss a model for you know, answering these three questions. And then you get to the next page, and it's like, um, how would you use your model to answer this next question? And it's like, shoot, I should have read that because I didn't build it into my model yet. So I have to like come up with this on the fly. That's a crazy exercise. We will not do that at this time. Yeah, I, I was more than anything. So, yeah. HPDs. Never going to change. So knowing your disks 
is probably the thing that makes your life easiest in this class. It will still be true on Wednesday. Nothing on KL divergence. So we just bring up lots of names and keep your interest, and we'll show you later how Bayesian utilizes. Um, turns out JITS is Metropolis Leasings in disguise. So, um, I didn't ask anything theoretical about Metropolis Leasings because I haven't proven anything to you about why it works. I just kind of wrote down the algorithm for you. Um, if I do ask anything about MH, it's going to be right down in the pseudocode. It's the same sort of thing that Jess was asking. I didn't write a problem that looked like that, though. Everything was give sample of all in the problem I, I wrote down this weekend. But if that disappoints you, I do have a good theoretical question on MH that I'm very likely to ask on the final. We just haven't learned it. Everything will be at the level of pseudocode in terms of the, the samplers. Uh, it's possible. I mean, I'm known to do it. So, to ask, like, a, what would you do? You know, make you make a, a choice like that, uh, where you have to write a sentence or two. It's possible. I usually regret doing it, because I always get back these answers where I'm like, ah. But it's a good thing to talk about, so I did write one. I have to see what my mood is when I assemble it. So it's possible. So I don't know if that helps you or hurts you, Jess. So then you just have this hand, what could I possibly have asked? Yeah, Send on a good note instead of this open home oh, pedal. No. Don't try to think back what I'm thinking. Oh. Okay. Good definitions? Um, I always have my way of getting definitions. I didn't write down a glossary question. So sometimes I do that and I say, define those five things mathematically and in words. I didn't do it on this exam. So, but in terms of definitions, I will be able to figure out from these problems if you know what the definitions are of things. So quite often, I'll use a term and ask you for it, and if you don't know what it is, you're host. Got to know what the question is, and that has to do with the terminology. The confidence set? Yeah, so no confidence sets on this, so... Um, That's kind of what this thing was about. That, nothing like that. So. Do you need to know the wish art distribution for the exam? You do not need to know the wish art distribution for the exam. No, it's a pity. It, yeah, it's typed in there. So, nope. There was no earlier in this <laughs> thing. It's still no. There will still be no on one thing. But glad to see you. You're, you're testing me. Okay, I think that's good for now, you guys. So study up. I think good um, test taking advice is homeworks. Work on it for speed. Try to go through those problems and see if you can make some minor adjustments to those problems and see if you understand the bigger point. And if I changed it to some other distribution that we've touched, could you do that problem? So this shouldn't be too difficult. I am going to be asking you a lot of easy things as well. And that's where people can get themselves into trouble is that they just don't know the definitions. So, um, easy medium questions. Or is it last one? Uh, well, some of you have to come to this today of example. Only say a sheet of paper. I will have your scratch paper 
in the back. I will provide you several sheets. I will have extra scratch paper, so the scratch paper will be provided in the exam. I'll provide you enough room where I think you can write your answers clearly. Um, if you do write it somewhere else, not in that section, let me know where it is, and you get a pen or a pencil so to work with. And so and that's it. Like cheat sheets, like they go for like... Cheers have cheat sheets. We don't do that one here. So no cheat sheets. So know your distributions. So still going to be true. <laughs> All the time. So, so yeah. No, I, I don't do that. I receive that. Okay, cool. Thanks, you guys.